Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to worship today. We trust we will all know God's blessing and challenge. Special thanks to Bobby Stevenson back with us this morning, and for the first time to John Murdoch, uh, formerly Minister of Khalid and Lone End. You're very welcome as well, John. We look forward to your, both your ministries. I just want to highlight, I hope you've got a copy of the announcements. If not, as always, please obtain one before you leave. But I just want to highlight the committee and Kirk session meeting tomorrow evening, Monday the 20th, community fridge on Friday, and then you'll see there's a notice there about graveyard and grounds tidy up. So please have a look at that, and if you can help in any way, you'll be very welcome as a volunteer. <coughs> and then finally, we have refreshments after the service, where again, you'll be very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for your warm words of welcome. It's a joy to be back with you uh, in Bush Mills this morning, uh, seeking to worship God together as we join together in his name. We trust and pray that we will know the help of his spirit as we worship. The time of the baptism of Jesus we read these words, Luke chapter 3 at verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Within just two verses, we find the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We continue in that vein in our first item of praise, glory be to God the Father.
we join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, as we continue to worship you, we do so humbly and in awe of your power and glory, which we don't always fully appreciate. Lord, the hymn writer refers to you as great Jehovah three in one. And yet those words have more depth and mean far more than we understand. We worship you, God the Father, because you've made the world and everything in it. And you've made us and you give to us breath and life. We praise you, God the Son, for coming from heaven to save us from our sins. On the cross, you took the punishment that we deserve for our disobedience. On the cross, you suffered and died in our place. Your body broken and your blood shed for our forgiveness and for our peace. We bless you, God the Spirit, for your activity in creation and in salvation, pointing us to Jesus, that we might appreciate what he has done for us. And Lord, your Spirit helps us to live the Christian life and also to serve you. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for your diversity and yet for your unity always working together for the good of the church on earth. Lord God, as we come today, we realize that no matter how good or upright we may have been in recent times, we are sinners in need of forgiveness. We need forgiveness for wanting our own way when it hasn't always been the best way or the right way. We need forgiveness for thinking that the world revolves around us. We need forgiveness for not standing up for Jesus when we have had opportunities to do so. Our Father, we need forgiveness for not loving you with heart and soul and mind and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, in our lives there are inconsistencies and double standards. Forgive us if we have talked the talk but not always walked the walk. Lord, we thank you that we need not be overwhelmed or overcome by our sins and failures. We needn't be weighed down by the wrongs we have done or the good we haven't done. Forgiveness comes afresh through Christ as we turn to him and seek his cleansing touch. And he renews our joy and restores our peace. May this indeed be our experience today. And may he be our helper and guide in the week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We read from the New Testament and from Acts chapter 16. Reading from the New Testament and from Acts chapter 16. And we're going to be reading at verse 16 of the chapter. Let us together hear God's word. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. 
She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned round and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell, trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them out into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Ending there at verse 34. Of Acts chapter 16. We thank God for his word. <clears throat> well boys and girls. I want to show you some people on the screen. And see if you can tell me what their job is. I might need a little bit of help with this from maybe an older boy or girl, whatever. But have a little look at the screen. You see a number of people there. And the first one at the top left-hand side is, of course, yes, a nurse. Yes, a nurse is the first one. And then in the middle we have... Come on, we're bound to know what the middle one is. Yes, again, dear. Yes, we've got a farmer on his tractor there. Sorry? And the next one's a teacher. You're away ahead of me, and that's great. Yes, the next one's a teacher. Two and two, of course, make five, or is it four? Yes, and then down at the bottom, we have... Well, it's all over his or well, it's his back. Yes, a police, a PSNI officer. And the last one is astronaut. an astronaut. Isn't that great? The last one's an astronaut. I think it is probably Tim Peake. Now, what is this man's job? Well, that's a little bit more tricky, and if you're listening carefully to the reading, you just might pick it up. A jailer. A jailer. Do you agree? Yes, I think you do. 
it, of course, is a prison officer, a prison warden, or a man who makes sure that no one escapes or gets out of his prison. In our Bible reading today, we were told a little bit about a prison warden or a prison officer, sometimes called the Philippine jailer. And his job was to make sure that no one escaped from his prison. Now, the prison warden we read about had a very big moment in his life one night. I would think it was a little bit scary for him. What do you think happened in his prison one night? Yes? The whole building began to shake, and I don't know if it fell down or not, but it certainly began to shake, and I'm sure that was quite scary for him. He had just got all the prisoners settled down for the night, and then the prison building began to shake, and the doors flew open, and the prison officer or the Philippine jailer thought, oh, the prisoners were going to escape. And he knew, he knew that if the prisoners had escaped from his prison, well then, his own life would be in danger because his job was to make sure no one ever escaped from prison. But then he heard a voice. It was the voice of a man called Paul, who was a Christian. And Paul told the prison uh, officer or the Philippine jailer not to panic, not to harm himself, because no prisoners had escaped, even though their chains fell off. And then Paul told him something very, very important. Paul told the Philippine jailer about Jesus and he and his family put their trust in Jesus. And as the Philippine jailer learned that God loved him, he wasn't afraid anymore. Boys and girls, young folk, grown-ups, sometimes God speaks quietly into our hearts and lives about Jesus and about following him. And some people come quietly to trust their lives to Jesus, and that's great. But sometimes, you know, God has to give us a wee bit of a shake to get our attention and get us to take Jesus seriously. Because in love, God wants us, invites us to put our trust in Jesus who loves us and who forgives our sins. Paul and his friend Silas were in prison because some people in a place called Philippi didn't like them going around telling men and women and boys and girls about Jesus. But Paul and Silas loved Jesus so much they couldn't help speaking about him. And the Philippine jailer was glad that he had Paul and his friend Silas for a wee while in his prison because he got to hear about Jesus. And he and his family put their trust in him. My hope and prayer is that you will come to understand God's love for you and come to put your trust in Jesus as your friend and as your saviour. Because to God, you are special. And he invites us to trust his son, the Lord Jesus. We're going to sing our children's piece now. I think we're singing it twice, John. I'm special because God has loved me.
We come now for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Our Father, we come to you aware today that many in our world are hurting and broken as a result of natural disasters or conflict in their areas. We think again of the situation in Turkey and Syria where there has been so much loss of life and destruction of communities. We pray, Lord, that you will extend your compassion and comfort to the grieving and traumatized. And we pray that you will minister to the injured through the hands of those who are attending to them and caring for them. Thank you, Lord, for stamina and guidance for those who were and still are involved with the work of rescue and recovery. Will you grant help and grace for the many challenges that lie ahead for these communities? Almighty God, we think also today of Russia's ongoing war on Ukraine. As it approaches the first anniversary this week, we pray for a de-escalation in activities and that minds will be turned away from conflict towards a peaceful resolution. And may we not forget the displaced and the grieving and the broken as a result of the past year's actions. Our Father, we bring before you our own land, mindful of the ongoing political standoff and stalemate, praying that soon outstanding issues will be resolved and that we will have a functioning executive working for the good of all. Then, Lord, within this congregation and community, there will be folk and families who need your encouragement and help. We bring the sad at heart and lonely to you, asking that you will assure them of your interest and love. We bring also the concerned or anxious to you, Lord, praying that you will bring calm to their minds and something of your peace to their hearts. Our Father, we pray for ourselves. Where we need refreshed in spirit, will you refresh us? Where we need courage to face the week ahead, will you grant courage to us? And if important decisions need to be made in the days ahead, we pray for wisdom and clarity and faith to go forward. Do continue with us. And as we return to your word, may we know the help of your spirit to understand and grasp what you have to say to us from it. All these prayers we ask in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. We continue to worship God as we bring our offering. Your offering will be received.
Let us pray. Lord God, having received so much from you for life and living, we offer again to you our time, our talents, and the offerings just given. Bless them, we pray, and use them for the good of your church and for the praise of your name. Amen. We continue in an attitude of prayer, really, as we sing our next piece, Father, I place into your hands. A few years ago, a quiet American couple called Perry and Anne Jordan became interested in prisoners and their problems. Indeed, their interest grew to such an extent that they began to visit prisons in the area of Florida. Perry and Anne were a Christian couple and as they sat down with prisoners to listen to them they also shared the good news of Jesus with those who showed some interest. Perry and Anne had experienced the love of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of Christ in their own lives and they wanted to share with prisoners what God could do for them. <clears throat> that quiet American couple, they came to see hardened prisoners turn from their sin and their past as they accepted Christ as their Savior. Now, it's not unusual for a person to make a profession of faith in prison and so show some signs of change in their lives, in their behavior, all in the hope of an earlier release date. But some of us may know someone who became a Christian in prison 
and they've gone on to make a useful contribution to society on their release. Earlier in our service, we read the story of a conversion in the context of a prison. Not the conversion of a prisoner, but rather that of a prison warden, usually referred to as the Philippine jailer. A little bit of background might help here, just a brief comment or two. Paul and Silas were in a place called Philippi, and they were moving around preaching the gospel, telling the story of Jesus. It was in Philippi that they had met with a woman called Lydia, whom they saw come to faith. However, Paul and Silas weren't all that long in the district until they got in trouble with the local authorities for preaching about Jesus and for calling people to follow him. And as a result of that, Paul and Silas, they were pulled in by the authorities and were thrown into prison. You read about that in verses 22 to 24 of Acts 16. And then what happened was this. About midnight there was an earthquake. Verse 26 says this. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. And when the warden woke up, he felt sure that the prisoners would have taken their chance to escape, to make a run for it. And if they did, well then, his life would be in danger. And just as he was about to take his own life because of what the authorities might do to him, he heard a voice. And that voice assured the Philippine jailer that no prisoners had escaped. No prisoners had made a run for it. Then, as we know, he inquired about salvation. And with one voice, Paul and Silas pointed the warden, pointed the Philippine jailer to the Lord Jesus. And through faith in the Lord Jesus, the jailer gets right with God and his life and his home are transformed. Some things I want us to notice about this man's conversion. Some things I want us to notice about his coming to faith. First, he asked an important question. He asked an important question. What was his question? Verse 30. Simply this, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This man obviously had a, a bit of religious knowledge. Perhaps he had a conversation with Paul and Silas and they had explained some things about Jesus to him. He asked an important question. You know, as we journey in life, we ask many important questions. We ask important questions when we are children because we want to know how this works and how that works. When we get a bit older, we ask important questions about subjects at school and career opportunities. And later on in life, we ask important questions about marriage, perhaps, or setting up a home, and so on. These are all important questions. And perhaps at some time in the life, in his life, the Philippine jailer asked questions like these. But none of life's questions so far touched on the spiritual side of things. That side of his life that he was now suddenly aware of. 
None of life's questions so far raise the important matter as to how he was before God. None of the questions he ever asked before had real bearing on the present as well as the future. The way this one did. And this is why the prison warden's question is so important. It involved God. And it involved him getting his life sorted out in relation to God. Now what helped to bring this man to his question? Might it have been the midnight crisis? The prison building shaking? Maybe. I can imagine at some point in the evening him going around checking the prison cells, making sure that they were secure. And he was obviously content that they were because verse 27 of our reading tells us that he was asleep at the time of the earthquake. Perhaps it was the crisis situation he found himself in that got him thinking about God in a way that he hadn't done before. Friends, nothing unusual about a person thinking about God at a time of crisis in their life. God sometimes speaks to us through some challenging experience, through some crisis moment. Not everyone who comes to profess faith in Jesus Christ does so as a result of a, a crisis in their life. For example, earlier in Acts chapter 16, we read of Lydia, who it seems came to faith quietly. And there are some of us here today, and as God has moved in our lives, quietly and without any drama, we have come to accept Jesus as our Savior. But perhaps there will be others of us in this service, and like the prison warden, it was during or after some crisis in our lives that we came to see our need that we were challenged to seek Jesus and to surrender our lives to him and we are thankful today for those circumstances that drew our attention to Jesus friends my concern is this there may be some of us here who have heard God speaking quietly to us about our sin and our need to look to Jesus Christ, but still we are holding back from putting our trust in him. And there may be some of us, and God has spoken to us through some crisis in our lives. But still, but still we think we can make it to God and to his heaven by ourselves, and we can't. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to get this life of mine right with God? That was the Philippian jailer's important question. And it may be that God prompted him to ask it through a crisis situation. But there's another reason for him asking this question. I suggest to you that he had heard about Jesus and his cross. And about how God was reaching out to men and women. Through him. For example, verse 25 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God, and as they did, they were no doubt telling the story of Jesus for all to hear, including the warden. And what would those in prison have heard? Well, they would have heard about a God who loved them but couldn't accept them the way they were. They would also have heard about Jesus dying on the cross for their sins. And they would have heard about the forgiveness and the new beginning Jesus could give. And as the Philippian jailer heard all of that, he began to, to ponder what he had heard. He began to understand he had a need that only Jesus could meet. Friends, I would suggest that all of us here today know the gospel. 
We know that Jesus has died on the cross for our sins and we know that the way to peace with God or to rightness with God or to reconciliation with God is through what Jesus has done. You can't have been attending Bush Mills Presbyterian Church in past times and not know the good news about Jesus. When the Philippine jailer realized where he stood, he wanted to find out more. He wanted to get his life on the right track. An important question. Notice an instant answer. Verse 31. They replied, Paul and Silas replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. In just ten words, we have the gospel in its simplest terms. Just what does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus? To believe in Jesus is to believe in who he was and is the Son of God. The one who was unique in his birth. The one who was unique in his life. To believe in Jesus, yes, is to believe in who he was. And to believe in Jesus is to believe in what he has done. What has he done? He has gone to the cross. And he has suffered and died there in our place and for our sins. In my place and for my sins. To believe in Jesus, yes, it is to believe in who he was. To believe in Jesus is to believe in what he has done. And to believe in Jesus is to believe that he offers forgiveness and hope to all who come. What a wonderful answer the Philippine jailer received. He was pointed simply and clearly to the Lord Jesus. Friends, please let's get this. The Philippine jailer wasn't pointed to some set of rules and regulations for salvation. He wasn't pointed to a list of do's and don'ts in order to make him more acceptable to God. Clearly and simply, he was pointed to Jesus. And my, how consistent Scripture is. Referring to Jesus in an earlier chapter of Acts, Peter says this, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men, given among people, by which we must be saved. The Philippian jailer's important question received an instant answer. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And how do we know he did that? How do we know he believed and received the Lord Jesus? There was a noticeable change in his life. Fear was gone and he had joy. He was glad in his heart. The gospel had impacted his life. He was changed. We're told in verse 34 about him being filled with joy because he had come to know God or because he had come to believe in God. Here's a, a, a man who was close to taking his own life but before a new day dawned, the Philippine jailer was rejoicing that he had heard of the love of God for him and that he had experienced God's love in a personal way. Change life. Young person, older person. Jesus Christ didn't come into the world to make those who receive him and follow him miserable. Sometimes that's the impression we give. He came to bring peace to lives and he came to bring joy within. Yes, becoming a follower of Jesus has a serious and challenging side to it. It's about being serious about our sin. It's about confessing our sins before a holy God. It's about commitment and devotion and service. But what a joy! Christ gives as we bow to him and trust him and love him. One of the changes we see in the prison warden's life, he had joy. Another change is this. 
and we shouldn't miss it. Because the Christian way isn't just about belief, it's about behavior as well. It isn't just about profession, it is about practice. Verse 33 speaks about the jailer washing the wounds Paul and Silas had. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, Paul and Silas, and washed their wounds. Remember, Paul and Silas were beaten before they were thrown into their prison cell. Verse 23 says that they were severely flogged. We don't need to go into the detail here, but you can imagine the rawness of their untreated injuries. And yet what's happening now is this. Paul and Silas are receiving from the jailer consideration and care. And we read too that the prison warden bought, brought Paul and Silas and into his home that night and set a meal before them. Friends, that's what the gospel does. It transforms lives so that we see a converted Zacchaeus becoming a fair tax collector. We see a woman at a well with something of a reputation becoming a witness for Jesus. And in our passage today, a converted jailer washing his prisoner's wounds and setting a meal before them. The gospel of Jesus Christ, when we respond to it, it doesn't leave us as we were. It impacts our lives. It does what no one else or nothing else can do. It brings a person right into the family of God and it brings about change in lives. The old goes and the new comes. I'm reading through a book at the moment about past revivals. And I came across this comment on what happened in some of the coal mines in Wales during the 1904 awakening or revival there. And I quote, Stoppages occurred in coal mines, not due to differences between management and workers, but because foul-mouthed miners became converted and stopped using foul language to the extent that the horses which hauled the coal trucks in the mines no longer understood what the miners were saying to them. Responding to the gospel doesn't just mend our relationship with our God. It impacts and changes our lives. The Philippine jailer's question, it was important. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It got an instant answer. Here it is. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. In other words, in hearing who Jesus was and what he had done, he then made that personal to himself. And we read of a changed life. He had joy, and not only in his own life, but his family had joy also. An important question, an instant answer, a changed life. Let's pray. Lord, your love for each of us is the same. And yet you choose to deal with us differently as you bring us to an understanding of your love. Sometimes you speak into our lives quietly. At other times you have to speak more loudly to us to get our attention. Our Father, will you encourage and affirm your people in this congregation and community? And will you graciously minister in the lives of men and women and young folk who have not yet considered Christ, not yet put their trust in the finished work of Jesus? In his name we pray. Amen. Well, the choice of the last hymn indeed is very fitting. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord.
And now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit rest, remain and abide with each of us today and always. Amen. <laughs>